good at? Friday is here. Everybody's happy for Friday. I'm happy for Friday. I kind of like to make this place look like sort of an Old Navy lighting in here. It's it just sort of feels like that, doesn't it? I'm not a fan of Old Navy, but I just, I don't know. All right. Um, we went through a lot of nomenclature last time, and we're going to go through a little bit more today. Uh, but we'll also talk about uh, carbohydrates in the context of uh, function inside of cell in terms of organisms. And I'll also talk a little bit about um, how uh, structure, as we talk about, implies function, how that's very important for things like polysaccharides. And so I'll say uh, a little bit about that uh, as well today. So um, last time I finished talking about uh, disaccharides, sucrose, maltose, and, and uh, lactose. And I pointed out the one that I thought was a better structure for uh, sucrose. So hopefully you'll use my structure and not the one that's in the book. Because I can guarantee you the TAs won't know the one in the book when they go to grade your exam. So that always comes back. Students, for some reason, write that structure that's in the book and they get graded wrong. And nobody understands why that's the case. And, it's because they didn't pay attention to what they should look at here. All right, well, enough of that. Uh, we've talked about monosaccharides. We've talked about disaccharides. And uh, there are oligosaccharides as well. And, but instead of talking about oligosaccharides, I'm going to jump to talking about polysaccharides. And then I'll come back and talk a little bit more about oligosaccharides after that. Okay? So polysaccharides, as the name implies, um, are polymers of saccharides. They are long chain things. So for example, um, uh, cellulose is a polymer of glucose. It contains only glucose. And poly meaning many, meaning it has many, many thousands of units of glucose linked one to another. Cellulose is a plant saccharide, uh, a plant polysaccharide they used uh, to help uh, strengthen their cell walls. Okay, animals don't make cellulose, right? Another plant polysaccharide that uh, we hear about, um, and it's a little confusing, is actually called starch. And starch is not a single polysaccharide, but instead it's a mixture of polysaccharides, as I will discuss later. It's a mixture of polysaccharides, all right? Now, the animal equivalent of starch is something called glycogen. They are structurally different, but there's some similarities to starch, as we shall see. Okay? So glycogen is a polymer of glucose. And it's a polymer of glucose that has what we call branches. So let's imagine, if we will, we took a glucose and we made a long chain of glucoses, alpha-1,4. So we talked about alpha-1,4 linkages last time. So we had, let's say, a um, hundred glucose residues, alpha-1,4, 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 alpha-1,4. You guys get the picture, right? So these guys go all the way down the line, make a very long chain of glucoses linked in this way. Okay? If we did that, we would create what we know as the simple plant polysaccharide known as amylose, A-M-Y-L-O-S-E. Well, how does that relate to glycogen? Well, we're getting there. Okay. So if I just had alpha-1,4 linkages, and that's all I had, I would have something we call amylose. All right? Now, if I were to take and about every 10 residues or so, insert a branch, okay? so I'm making sort of a Y-shaped structure. I make a branch. I can make it by linking the alpha-1,6 to the chain that's already got the alpha-1,4. So here on the bottom, going from left to right or right to left, is a string of alpha-1,4s. And now here's a branch that's come up. It's a link of alpha-1,6. OK? This branch can now also link alpha-1,4, 1,4, 4, moving to the left. OK? It can also link alpha-1,4, 1,4, 4, 4, going to the left. So the branch is only that one alpha-1,6 residue, and then it makes a new alpha-1,4,1,4,1,4 1, 4, 1, 4, 1, 4 going along that way. If we do one of those branches about every 10 glucose units, we create glycogen. So if we do that branch about every 10 units, we create glycogen. 
Well, if this, if this long one that we have down here is 1,000 units long, we've got 100 branches, and each of those branches can have branches. We can imagine that glycogen can be a very, very branched structure. Okay? A small tree might only have a couple of branches. A mature oak has got thousands and thousands of branches, and glycogen is like that mature oak. It's got thousands and thousands and thousands of branches. Okay? It turns out that those thousands and thousands and thousands of branches make very, very good sense from a structural point of view. Now, I'll talk about why in a minute. But I want you to keep those branches in mind as I'm talking about that. All right? So, I talked about plant polysaccharides, and I said starch is a mixture of plant polysaccharides. Amylose is one of the components of starch. It's not the only component. It's one of the components of starch. All right? Another component of starch is kind of like glycogen. It's kind of like glycogen. It also has alpha-1,6 branches, just like glycogen does, but it doesn't have nearly as many. Instead of about every 10 glucose residues, amylo, this other polysaccharide is called amylopectin, A-M-Y-L-O-P-E-C-T-I-N. Amylopectin only has branches about every 30 to 50 residues. Now that turns out to be significant. It means that amylopectin is not nearly as branched as glycogen is. Okay? So I want you to envision that oak tree that is glycogen that's got those thousands of branches. And then I want you to envision another tree that isn't nearly so branched. Maybe a Douglas fir. Okay? So we're comparing a Douglas fir to uh, a massive, mature oak tree. All right? If we were to look at that, we would say the number of individual ends of branches would be much, much greater in the oak than it would be in the, in the um, Douglas fir. Okay? Glycogen is the oak. Amylopectin is the Douglas fir. Now, the structural significance of that is that when we look at the breakdown of these polymers, okay, they start at the ends and move inwards. They start at the ends and move inwards. So something that has more ends is going to more quickly generate more breakdown products. The breakdown products of these polysaccharides are glucose. Okay, so what it means is that when we break down glycogen, we can break down and get much more glucose much quicker if we have glycogen as our polysaccharide than if we have amylopectin as our polysaccharide. Well, of course, we don't have amylopectin as our polysaccharide, and the reason that we don't is because we need that big burst of glucose sometimes. We have to run. We have to escape from something chasing us. Plants don't have to do that. The needs of plants don't vary considerably. They don't need rapid bursts of energy to do things. And consequently, they don't need very branched polysaccharides. Make sense? Quiet group today? Nobody's even nodding. Does that mean everybody's asleep at this point? No? No. Well, you're just nodding that way. That's good. Yes? Does that mean that we use like, amylose as like, a storage? Like a we don't use amylose. We use only glycogen. So when you're eating starches, the plant has used that as a storage form of glucose. We're using glycogen as a storage form. When we look at glycogen in our body, we find it predominantly in our liver and in our muscles. That's where we find glycogen, and that's the two places in our body where we want to have very rapid production of oxygen, if necessary, of, of glucose, if necessary. Well, oxygen, not work, mine's not working here. But glucose, if necessary, okay? All right, so structure is important for function. I also mentioned 
Um, cellulose, how does cellulose fit into this picture? Well, cellulose fits into this picture. It's also a polymer of glucose, but instead of having alpha-1,4 linkages, it has beta-1,4 linkages. It's a very simple change in structure, but that simple change in structure has enormous implications. We cannot digest cellulose in our body. We cannot get glucose out of plant cell walls. Cellulose is abundant. You guys want to draw that structure for the uh, next exam? <laughs> Wouldn't you love me if I put that on there? Please draw the structure of glucose that you found in figure 11.14. Okay. What? Cellulose, yeah. What did I say? Glucose. Glucose. Oh, God. You already asked us to do glucose. I was asked, I was, glucose on the mind is what I have. Glucose and oxygen on the mind for some reason. Yes, draw that structure of cellulose on the next exam. That'd be great. Okay. So this guy's beta 1,4 instead of alpha 1,4. That simple difference means we can't digest cellulose in our uh, bodies. We can't get all of the energy out of plants. It's because of this that we think of plants as roughage. Okay? Largely undigested by our digestive system, they go scooting through our digestive system. Okay? Some organisms can break this down. They're known as ruminants. Cows, for example. The reason a cow goes out and eats grass is because it has an enzyme in a bacterium in its specialized stomach called cellulase. Cellulase. Just like cellulose, except you put an A where the O is. Cellulase breaks those bonds down and releases glucose so that the cow get, or a sheep gets plenty of energy from the grass that it's eating. We can't do that. Okay? The, the, the cow doesn't have the gene to do it either. The, this cow is getting it from a bacterium that's in its rumen that has that enzyme. And the rumen, and people say, well, we put that, that thing in, in our stomachs, can we then break down cellulose? Well, the cow has a specialized stomach that this wouldn't grow in our, this wouldn't work in our stomachs. And I'm not sure how many people want to go out and eat the grass in their yard as a way of having dinner. So, yes? How do they get it in their stomachs to begin with? It's, a, it, it's actually a complicated question. Any organism gets it, it, it's, it's, it's a, a microbiological flora by a variety of means, including contact with mom um, and or the environment. So, um, and I can't tell you specifically how a cow gets it, but that's the, uh, the most common route would be like through mom. Okay, um, let's see. There's starch and glycogen, and I'm not sure that's a very good figure, but it's mainly showing you the alpha 1,4s. It's not showing you the alpha 1,6s of glycogen, so it's only showing you the alpha 1,4 linkages there. Yes? What makes, that's a good question. What, what makes, why is it that cellulase isn't produced by the cow um, itself. I don't have an answer for that evolutionarily. Um, obviously, there's a symbiotic relationship that's, that has evolved between the cow and the bacterium, or the ruminant and the bacterium. Um, and it wasn't important enough along the way to um, evolve an ability to break that down. I, beyond that, I, I don't have an answer for that question uh, for you. Um, the, uh, if we look at organisms that are, you know, how, what they ate and how that has evolved, that hasn't been a, a linear chain. So we see, for example, things that you know, are uh, omnivores, and we see those that are carnivores, and those that are herbivores, and that's all over the map. So probably there wasn't an evolutionary pressure to uh, simply make this for herb herbivores, for example. But yeah, it's, it, I, beyond that, I, I'm, I'm hand-waving, so, okay? Okay, um, all right, so that's polysaccharides. Now I wanna back up a little bit uh, and say something about um, something that relates more so to um, oligosaccharides, although we do see some polysaccharides there as well. And these are um, linkages between saccharides, usually poly or oligosaccharides, and proteins. Okay? So some linkages between them. All right? So when we see these linkages, we remember we have to be linking a sugar that's connected to a bunch of other sugars to an amino acid that's connected to a bunch of other amino acids. We're creating a link between a protein 
and a polysaccharide or a protein and an oligosaccharide. Okay? The important thing that you see in terms of that linkage is shown on the screen, meaning that this um, uh, uh, one on the left is what we call an N-linked um, N-acetyl glucose. All right? These are what we call N-linked um, uh, protein, poly I'm sorry, um, uh, polysaccharides. And these are O-linked polysaccharides, or O-linked oligosaccharides. The difference being that the linkage in the case of the N-linked is through this nitrogen of asparagine. The side chain of asparagine has a nitrogen that gets linked to a sugar in this saccharide down here. In the case of O-linked, they're linked through the oxygen of serine. In both cases, they're linked to an N-acetyl sugar. On the left, we're linking it to N-acetyl glucose. On the right, we're linking it to N-acetyl galactose. Okay? And there's the N-acetyl, there's the N-acetyl, there's the galactose, there's the glucose, and there's the linkage to the uh, proteins up there. Okay. Now, these two turn out to be somewhat different from each other. Okay? These guys on the right are made only in the Golgi apparatus. And these guys on the left are made in the Golgi and the endoplasmic reticulum. Okay. Now, why do we make this linkage? Well, it turns out that proteins frequently have other things that help them to accomplish what they do. In some cases here, these are proteins, or they're called glycoproteins, that are found on the surface of cell membranes. Surface of cell membranes. So a glycoprotein, I just introduced a new term, a glycoprotein is a protein linked to an oligosaccharide or a polysaccharide, usually an oligosaccharide. Okay? Glycoprotein. Name tells you what it has. Okay. Now, yes? That's the two types of linkages we see between saccharides and proteins, yes. Okay? All right. Now, um, I'd like to show you this figure because it gives you a little bit of an idea of the complexity um, of these things. And it's showing uh, N-linked glycoproteins. Okay? N-linked glycoproteins. So that means we've got an asparagine. All right? And we've got an asparagine that's linked to an N-acetyl glucosamine. That's what this is right here which is what I was calling N-acetyl glucose, same thing. All right? We see it's linked to two of those, and then we see a common core that's up, up here. This common core is shown in, in this Y structure. All, right? all of the N-acetyl uh, glycoproteins will have this structure. Okay? Two N-acetyl glucoses followed by this, this Y-shaped structure of mannoses. All right? So they all have this common core that's shown in gray. And they will vary or they will differ from each other in terms of what's attached to them, what's attached to that Y-shaped structure. So in this case, we see a bunch of other mannoses that are linked out there. Here's a different one that has some N-acetyl glucose is linked. Here's, it's got some galactose. It's got a variety of different things uh, that are out here. Why are there different ones? Well, it turns out that in some cases, in many cases, in fact, these things that, are, that, are, that you see are sticking outside of cells. They're located in the membranes of cells. They're sticking out of cells, projecting outwards, and giving identity. Giving identity. So for example, blood types have this. And they vary in the composition of what's out here Okay, and according to the different blood type that you have. Right? These identity markers that we see in the glycoproteins that are found on the surface of cells are important in things like tissue rejection. Your body recognizes those patterns that you have on your cells. You try to transplant an organ from another uh, person who has a different pattern, and the body is going to see that as foreign, and we'll attack it. That's, the known as, that's what's known as organ rejection. Okay? So these identity markers can have some pretty important consequences. In tr yes? Yeah. 
If an organ is rejected, can it be tried again elsewhere? No. Basically, it would be useless at that point. Yep. So are these uh, identification markers synonymous with uh, antigens? Are these identification markers synonymous with antigens? They can be, yes. So an antigen is something recognized by an antibody. So if we're talking about something being rejected, then there's antibodies that are attacking it. In that case, you would say the answer is yes. Yep. OK. Uh, so that is the linkages. Um, here is an example of a protein. Uh, this is actually a protein that helps to stimulate the um, production of, um, of blood cells. It's called erythropoietin. And you can see here's the protein part of it, and here's the various carbohydrate structures sticking off of it. I said these were involved in identity, and that's one of the things they can be involved in. They can also be involved in helping the protein to function or get oriented within a cell. Okay, so that's just a structure to show you something about that. All right. Now, I want to turn from glycoproteins, which are relatively simple structures, to more complex um, structures that involve polysaccharides. Okay, so for the most part, as I said, glycoproteins are oligosaccharides attached to proteins. A few polysaccharides, but mostly oligosaccharides. By contrast, I want to talk now about um, a group of uh, molecules that we call glycosam glycosaminoglycans. Okay? Glycosaminoglycans. Now, these names sort of sound alike, glycoprotein, glycosaminoglycans. But glycosaminoglycans tells you something about their structure. All right? Glycosaminoglycans are large polysaccharides that have amines in them, okay, that have an unusual structure, as we shall see. Okay? So what you're seeing on the screen are one, two, three, four, five different glycosaminoglycans. These are polysaccharides, and you're seeing the repeating unit for each one on the screen. The repeating unit. So that means that you will have thousands of this pair linked to the same pair, linked to the same pair, linked to the same pair, et cetera, et cetera. These guys can have molecular weights in the millions. They may be attached to a protein. Okay? They may be attached to a protein. The protein in these really isn't the most important part, though. The most important part is what you see on the screen, because these guys are what we call polyanionic, meaning many, many negative charges. Every one of them you see is a modified sugar. And every one of them has at least one negative charge. This guy's got a carboxyl and a sulfate. This guy's got a sulfate. This guy's got sulfate down here, carboxyl and a sulfate here, a variety of things, OK? Well, why are these guys so interesting and unusual, all right? Well, it's this polyanionic nature of them, OK? Let's imagine that I had a central uh, protein okay, that I attached these guys to, OK? Let's say I had a central protein like this that I attached these guys to, all right? So out here, you see on the side, you see these glycosaminoglycans that have been attached to a protein, the protein being in here. Okay, here's the protein in here. We see a whole bunch of these guys lined up. And what the protein functions to do is it functions to hold all these guys into relatively close proximity. And here's actually a protein as well. Okay, so these are all lined up, various proteins that are, this is linked to. It functions to hold them all close to each other. Well, there's a problem with that. They don't get along. They don't get along because they're all thousands of negative charges. And negative charges have this very distinct tendency of repelling each other. So what they do is they repel each other. They get as far away as they can from each other. They actually look like this. And they actually change the property of the water that they're dissolved in. They form these big shells around uh, with, with each one. And these big shells have the chemical property 
for the most part, that they're slippery. They convert water, which is wet, into something that's fairly slippery. Okay? So this polyanionic nature of these guys being held together in this way creates a very slippery substance. Well, what are some examples? Snot's a real good one. Okay? Snot's full of this stuff. Okay? The um, lubricating um, uh, synovial fluid that you have in your joints is another example. Okay? It acts like oil because it's slippery and it has some very useful properties about being able to absorb shock. Okay? That's two things that we can do with those. Here's another one. Okay? If we go back and we look at this guy right here, heparin. Anybody know what heparin is used for? It's anti-blood clotter. Now I want you to look at that structure and tell me why you think it might be a useful anti-blood clotter. Anything come to mind? It's binding to calcium. Very good. It's negatively charged. It's grabbing a hold of calcium. And what's calcium important for? Holding prothrombin at the site of the clot. This guy is pulling calcium away, reducing the likelihood that prothrombin will be at the site of the clot, and therefore reducing the likelihood of clotting. Okay, very good, very good. Okay, so interesting properties arise as a result of those. Okay, now I've already, oh, oh, I should give you some more terminology. So glycosaminoglycans are the polymer of those long chain things. If I take a glycosaminoglycan and I attach it to a protein, I create a proteoglycan. Okay? Glycoproteins, as I said, are mostly oligosaccharides. And you've seen this before, but I'll show you again. There's some more examples of some various uh, ones. These are the blood types, and this is what the blood types actually look like. Okay? The blood types are actually um, linked through um, the, um, uh, the O linkage that we saw before. Okay? And they vary only in very slightly different ways. Here's the O antigen, which lacks anything out here. Here's the A antigen, which has uh, uh, N-acetyl galactose. And here's the B antigen, which has galactose. That's the only difference in the three blood types that you see on the screen. Yes? So then the AB would combine. Okay, um, let's see, what else I got to say? Um, more, okay, end linked, et cetera. Okay, um, well, I know I was going to show you, okay. When we look at the um, synthesis of these guys uh, in uh, the endoplasmic reticulum, they occur in an interesting way. So in the endoplasmic reticulum, we have the ability, this is, remember in the endoplasmic reticulum, we can make the N-linked um, uh, glycoproteins. All right? The N-linked glycoproteins have that oligosaccharide that gets put onto the protein. The question is, well, where and how does it get put onto that protein that it's ultimately going to be linked to? All right? How does that occur? Well, that occurs in the endoplasmic reticulum. It starts in the endoplasmic reticulum. And when it starts in the endoplasmic reticulum, what happens is the oligosaccharide gets synthesized first. And it's synthesized not inside of the, of the endoplasmic reticulum, but instead it's synthesized on this molecule, which is sticking outside of the endoplasmic reticulum. So this dolichol phosphate is embedded in the membrane of the endoplasmic reticulum. And sticking out, facing outwards into the cytoplasm, is this structure right here. It's on this structure that that basic core that you saw, that Y-shaped structure, will be attached. So that Y-shaped structure will get attached here. Then something really interesting happens, and it's not completely understood how, but this structure then inverts in the membrane. So where it was before facing out, 
it now faces in. Now, this Y-shaped structure, which has been assembled here, is available to be attached to glycoproteins. Or to protein to make a glycoprotein. I shouldn't say to glycoproteins, but to a protein to make a glycoprotein. So dolicophosphate plays an important role in the synthesis of glycoproteins in the endoplasmic reticulum. Now, when I talked about the interlinked ones, I said, well, they can be made in the... Um, endoplasmic reticulum. They can also be made in the Golgi. It turns out that they're processed. The processing starts in the endoplasmic reticulum, moves into the Golgi, and then ultimately to where the protein is going to reside. Okay? In the case of the O-linked glycoproteins, they simply start in the Golgi and then they go to their destination. So they don't have an additional step of processing. If we look at their moving, we see this. Here's the endoplasmic reticulum, okay, budding off into uh, the uh, Golgi apparatus, which buds off, and then the destination of these proteins is set by the pattern of oligosaccharides that they have on their surface. Some patterns of oligosaccharide will destine those proteins to, to reside, reside in the cell membrane. Some will destine those proteins to be secreted and left out of the cell etc. They may have other cellular destinations as well, such as over here. But it's this pattern of oligosaccharides that's on these guys that ultimately determines where it is they're going to go. Okay, questions about that? Everybody's stunned by that, I can tell. Okay. Um, The last thing I want to talk about um, is the um, flu virus. It's relevant. How many people have gotten flu shots? Oh, man, the number of people that don't get flu shots scare me. All right? We've spent how many years, how many hundreds of years evolving technology for us to be able to be protected, and people don't go out and do that? I just find that amazing. <coughs> Has, has, body, has the body figured out how to stop the flu? Has the body figured out how to stop smallpox? Has the body figured out how to stop polio? The body hasn't done that, has it? Okay, so that's not a valid argument. Okay. <coughs> I'm sorry? We're better than our bodies? Yeah. We are our bodies. All right. Okay. All right, get a flu shot. Now. This is relevant, OK? When we look at um, a flu virus, a flu virus looks like this. When people wonder, why, why do you have to get a flu shot every year? Right? Well, a flu virus doesn't have one nucleic acid. It typically has several nucleic acids within it. It has RNAs inside of there. And these RNAs can be readily swapped, mixed, matched, etc. And so the flu is a constantly moving target. A constantly moving target. All right? Now, I'm not going to talk about the vaccine component of flu. I'm going to talk about the antiviral component of flu. The antiviral component of flu is very important, okay? Because a vaccine is, is good to some extent, but for flu, it doesn't work perfectly. It works reasonably well, but it doesn't give 100% protection, okay? 90% is still pretty good protection but we would like to be able to knock that out. So if we have flu and we have something that our immune system is not recognizing and the flu hits us, we want to be able to protect against that. So people have, re have designed drugs against the flu that um, are very interesting in, in their function. All right? We look at the surface of uh, the flu virus, we see the following. Okay? We see something called hemagglutinin and we see something called a neuraminidase. All right? The hemagglutinin is important for this, the uh, flu virus to recognize an oligosaccharide on the cell surface and attach to it. So yes, those are used by viruses to their advantage. They attach to a specific oligosaccharide on the cell surface and attach to it. That results in the injection of the flu virus nucleic acids into the cell, which get translated by that cell. Okay and make more 
flu virus nucleic acids and more flu virus capsids. And then the neuraminidase in exiting the cell cleaves, actually clips a residue on a, um, uh, a glycoprotein, or, uh, I'm sorry, on an oligosaccharide that's found in the membrane. That's necessary for the flu virus to exit. So the exit portion of the flu virus relies on the action of a neuraminidase clipping an oligosaccharide in the cell's membrane. Without that clipping action, this flu virus doesn't make it out of the cell. So it goes through its whole cycle. It hasn't, it hasn't been able to, repl it's replicated, but it hasn't been able to escape, all right, if it can't clip that residue. Well, that's the target of the flu virus antiviral drug called Tamiflu. T-A-M-I-F-L-U. Tamiflu interferes with the ability of the virus to exit the cell. It can't get out. Okay. Tamiflu, like the vaccine itself, isn't effective against all flus, but it does give some protection. And in many cases, um, can actually reduce the symptoms of a flu uh, pretty significantly. Questions about that? So neuraminidase is, is, its catalytic activity is necessary for the flu virus to exit the cell. It's actually clipping a sugar off of an oligosaccharide that's found in the membrane, and that is necessary for the exit of the virus. Without that clipping, it doesn't make it out. Yes, sir? Tamiflu attack, it blocks the neuraminidase. Okay, so it attaches to it and blocks it so it can't actually attach Yes, it. and it's a competitive inhibitor. Yes? Uh, echinacea is not a compound. Echinacea is a, uh, is, is a mixture of compounds. So I, I, can't, I can't address that, unfortunately. Okay. Okay, yes? So if it can't get out, then its, it's, it's uh, infectivity is reduced significantly. So yes, that, that's basically what happens. So whenever you're working against an infection, you're trying to reduce the amount of spread that it's getting. So this is one way of, of, of attacking that. Yes? Um, I can't tell you that. But it's a necessary step for it to get out of the cell. Yes? Neuraminidase is a common feature of many flu viruses, yes, yes. Um, it's actually encoded by the, the, uh, the flu virus uh, nucleic acid. Uh, I see a hand? No. Okay, well, uh, we have a few minutes. Why don't we go through and let's remember what we've learned, okay? Have a song. Yay. We need a break, okay. This one's called Structural Lullaby. And I have a recording of it. You can sing along with it. Uh, if I can find it here. No, nope, it's the wrong one. Well, now come on. I thought I had it. Here we go. Okay, there we go. Sleep, you can keep learning more about sugars, fish or schemes, how it brings. Sides can collide, favor and share over full form. Facial guides coincide with the way structures form. Okay, let's see. Now I think I'm missing. Go back to here. Okay. Um, by the way, I, I don't think I've used the term Hayworth. I've, I've mentioned it in the songs, and I haven't said it here. So I should tell you briefly what that is. Uh, a Hayworth structure is the ring. 
So when we talk about a ring structure, that's what a Hayworth structure actually is. If we talk about straight chain, that's Fisher. Okay, so Fisher versus Hayworth are two different ways of drawing uh, saccharides. Okay, well, right now I want to turn our attention uh, to the next topic and again get a little bit ahead. By the way, I won't be here on Monday. Uh, my wife, Indira, will be lecturing for me because I'm giving a lecture somewhere else. So she'll be lecturing here. Everybody's smiling at this. <laughs> we don't have to look at him anymore. This is really good, right? Okay, so you'll have something to look forward to on Monday besides me. Uh, She'll be using the format. She'll also be videotaped, but she has assured me she will not sing under any circumstances. So, uh, so maybe that's good too. I don't know. Uh, she sings better than I do, so it'd be better if she sang than, than if I sang. But she'll be talking um, on Monday on this topic of cellular signaling. Okay? So cellular signaling is um, the last thing we're going to talk about before we talk about metabolism. Cellular signaling is um, the way that cells talk to each other. All right? Cells in the body talk to each other. The most common way they talk to each other is via hormones. And we're going to spend a fair amount of time talking about hormone signaling. Okay? So, here's some common hormones that uh, we find in the body. All right? And here are the things that they bind to. So, we'll talk a lot about epinephrine. Epinephrine, I've already mentioned it briefly is a hormone that our body releases when we get scared. It's also known as adrenaline. And that hormone is released in one part of our body, the adrenal glands, okay? And it travels to target cells in other parts of our body. These include the muscles and the liver, which co not coincidentally is where the glycogen is also found. When they get to those cells, they find something that they can bind to, and the something they can bind to is a specific receptor. In the case of epinephrine, it's known as the beta-adrenergic receptor. When it binds to that receptor, it causes a change in the receptor that results in a series of steps inside of the cell that cause the cell, in the case of a liver cell or a muscle cell, to release and to, to produce things for energy. Okay? Insulin is another hormone we hear a lot about. We hear about it with respect to diabetes, but insulin does many, many things. One of the things that insulin does is it's released by our pancreas, okay? And it can travel, again, through the bloodstream, hit target cells, which are a much broader group of cells than we saw with uh, epinephrine, and cause a variety of changes to happen that will cause those cells to take up glucose, to take glucose out of the bloodstream. You're going to hear me say this many times over the next few days and next term as well, and that is this is very important because glucose is a poison. Glucose is a poison and your body treats it as such. We'll see what that means later. But this hormone is really important because it's reducing our blood levels of glucose and glucose is a poison. Very good evidence for that. Look at the effects of diabetes. In diabetes, people's blood sugar goes astronomically high. They can lose their vision. As they get older, many times they have amputations because they're actually damaging tissues. They can damage their kidneys, etc. And it's happening because glucose levels are rising out of control. Okay. The last one is a, uh, this, oh, by the way, insulin is a protein. It's, a, it's a, what we call a peptide hormone. Epidermal growth factor is also a peptide hormone. And it has a receptor of its own. And it stimulates cells to grow and divide. Okay? Now, all three of these are very, very important things for cells. I want to focus first on um, just some general things about signaling itself. Okay? So what I've told you already was this. Here's the signal. Maybe that signal was, oh my God, I'm scared to death, and my body starts producing adrenaline. Okay? It releases a signal 
which in the case of epinephrine or adrenaline, that's what the signal is. That signal travels to the target tissues where there's a receptor. The receptor causes something to happen inside of the cell. This is, this is a phenomenon known as transduction. And transduction results in the response. That response may be, okay, let's release some glucose. That response might be, okay, let's take up some glucose. That response might be, okay, it's time to divide. Or, okay, it's not time to divide. Okay? So, that's what's happening when cells are talking to each other. The signal comes from something we call... Um, actually, let me back up on that. Let me back up on that. The signal comes from something we call a first messenger. All right? So epinephrine was a first messenger. Insulin was a first messenger. Or EGF uh, was a first messenger. Okay? Those hormones are the first messengers. However, once the first messengers bind to cells, they have to do something inside the cells, and that's the action of second messengers. What you see on the screen are some second messengers that help to communicate this signal. We're going to see this signaling goes through numerous steps to ultimately cause the response, whether it's division, whether it's releasing glucose, whether it's picking up glucose, or other things that the cell is doing. Those responses are coming as a result of multiple steps, and these guys play a role in those multiple steps. We'll talk about all of them. Okay, we've already talked about cyclic AMP already. We'll talk about it more in just a bit. Okay? Now, you're not going to need to know the structures of those. Don't worry about that. I want to introduce the topic of, seven, uh, of, of, of the receptors themselves. The receptors fall into several categories. The receptors are proteins that are found in the cell membrane. Not all cells have the same receptors. I talked about how the epinephrine receptors, the, the beta-adrenergic receptors that bind to epinephrine, were found in liver and muscle predominantly. Okay. These receptors have, uh, one group of these receptors have a common structure. They're called 7TMs. Okay? These are some of the processes that 7TM receptors have roles in. No, I'm not expecting you to memorize the, the list. But you can see there's quite a wide variety of things that they're involved in. Why do we call them 7TMs? This schematically shows what they look like. They're found in the membrane of cells. They have an amino terminus, they have a carboxy terminus, and they wind through the cell seven times. That TM stands for transmembrane. Many receptors look like that. Okay, so I'm not going to take you through this, the steps of the process, but I do have one other thing to announce today. I'm going on a diet. Here is my goal. <laughs> I'll be thin at Christmas if I drop 12 pounds. I'll be spelled beneath the belt as hopeful as that sounds. No Thanksgiving turkey. Salad's fine for me. I'll be eating lightly. Of this I guarantee. I'll be thin at Christmas. Exercise is key. I'm the one to take a run. To get the Christmas tree, Christmas Eve will find me narrowed at the gut. I'll be thin for Christmas, especially round my butt. All right, I am going on a diet. <laughs> 